Welcome back to D20 Tactics. On this channel, I play Dungeons and Dragons with my friends, and we explore combat scenarios and play out the tactics used to defeat monsters quickly and safely, giving you more time to get back to roleplaying. I'm your host and Dungeon Master, Sarson Zero, and this week we have a recap of the dungeon recently completed by Azure Wolf, Blind Oracle, Longfish, and Trained Rex. First, I'll replay the six encounters on the White Dragon's Mountain, and then we'll talk about the encounters that we thought deserved more commentary. If you've recently watched those encounters, I'll put a timestamp for the start of the discussion in the description below. All of our heroes made it home after this one, so sit back, relax, and enjoy. The adventurers are adventuring into the frozen tundra, where a white dragon has been reported. They're going to go up to the top of the mountain, slay the dragon, and then gain the treasure. Hit points, abilities, spells, items in hand, starting with Longfish. I'm Longfish, I'm currently at 137 hit points. I'm holding the Staff of Python and Shield plus one. I have four level one, two level two, three level three, two level four, two level five, and one level seven spell slot. I'm also holding both charges of my channel divinity. I'm Azure Wolf. I'm holding in my hands currently the Wand of the War Mage plus two, Wand of Magic Missiles. I have my Arcane Recovery, four first level slots, three second level slots, three third level slots, three fourth level slots, two fifth level slots, and one sixth level slot remaining. My semi lacrim has all those spell slots available and he has half my HP, so he was at 40 HP. I am handing him the wand of the war mage plus one. So I have 139 out of 139 hit points. I'm holding a plus one short bow with plus one arrows in the quiver for said short bow. Sneak dice on tap all day. Uh, level 13 fighter is, after that delicious feast, at 166 hit points, holding that plus two great axe, just in case, has a javelin of lightning on their back. You're the first one to figure out you can have a great axe in one hand and a javelin in the other ready to go, and then put one away when you're ready to swing. In this encounter, we have two monsters, which I do not know how to pronounce, so I'm going to say Remoraz. People also say Remraz or other things, but I'm going to say Remoraz. There's a young Remoraz and a middle-aged Remoraz. Remoraz has heated body, so any creature that touches it or strikes it with a melee attack takes 2d6 fire damage on the young one and 3d6 fire damage on the middle-aged one. They both have a bite which will do some damage. The middle-aged one has a 10-foot reach on the bite, and it also does fire damage. If it bites a creature, that creature is grappled, and the grappling is also restraining. The middle-aged Remoraz can swallow creatures. They are immune to cold, they are immune to fire, they have dark vision and tremor sense, so the rogue will be detected if the rogue is on the ground, and they can also burrow 20 feet. I have a question about the Remoraz. What is the range on their tremor sense? 60 feet. Okay, thank you. Pushing these Remoras through the tunnels, guiding them on to attack the targets, are a number of orcs. We have two elite orcs, known as Orogs. They have great axes and javelins, multi-attack and plate armor. And there is also a single regular orc. He's got great axes and javelins and hide armor. Terrain and effects. This encounter has a lot of impassable terrain as you guys are boxed in inside of this tunnel system. There's a single square of impassable terrain where these pillars come up, but you can run around behind them if you want. Then there's also a bunch of ice along the walls. This is dangerous terrain. It is a DC 17 acrobatics check to walk along that. If you try to walk along that and you fail the acrobatics check, you will fall prone and stop moving. So that's what you can move along. Is that even with the boots on? that we've all forgot to mention we had. If you have Boots of the Winter Land, you do not have to make that check. Tactics, what tactics do you think you're gonna use in this fight? I think we go all airborne on this one. That makes sense to me. Most of my attacks are going to be up close unless I wanna to toss that javelin. Because there's nowhere to place a spanking tank with that move apart from the orcs, but yeah. Well, let's go ahead and roll some initiative then. This decides our fate. <laughs> Anybody have higher than a 20? 20? 23 on the wizard. Golf clap. Anybody have between a 20 and a 15? 20 for the rogue. Anybody have between a 15 and a 10? Anybody have between a 10 and a 5? 9 for the fighter. 9 for Mr. Boo Gallington. I have a 6 for the Remoraz. 6 for the clerk. Each wolf, kick us off. So I'm going to touch Blind Oracle here and give them fly along with myself. I can fly myself at this point. Oh, you got your things, don't you? Mm-hmm. I was about to use the similar rack. I'm going to get all four of us. Ah, okay, no, then do that. 
blind oracle and me are going to go flying. Going to move as high as I can. 25 feet. And give the command to the simulacrum to do the same to, let's go fighter. And then the simulacrum will cast fly on the fighter. And himself. We're outcasting us, so we're getting two people. That makes it a fourth level spell. What's a simulacrum doing on its turn? Flying up. Sorry, cleric, I'm leaving you on the ground because you're the most tanky. That's the Azure Wolf. <laughs> After that is the blind oracle. It does not look like there is anything to hide amongst the ceiling. We are also going to go 25 feet up. Let's go back and hide amongst the outcroppings up there. I have no idea what that's actually going to do to line of sight, but we'll figure it out. Can't see all of you. Okay, cool. What is their minimum perception? Passive perception is 10. Maximum is 20. My minimum roll on self at this point is uh, 25. So you're going to be auto passing those. Then take my standard action to shoot the Remoraz. 24 to hit. Hits. 37 points of damage. After the blind oracle, we go to the train. I'm going to move west just to the other side of that icicle because that's just under 30. You have 60 feet of movement while you fly, I believe. Correct. Let's face check that right up against that Remoraz and start using my attacks. So that's a total 25 to hit. Hits. That's total 14. When you hit the Remoraz, it's going to do damage to you. Take 14 points of fire damage. Second attack, nat 1. And it's not going to make it. Nope. And third attack. 21 total. Hits. 11. And take nine points of fire damage. After the train is the owl. Let's move in to the west there and aggravate for the fighter's next turn. Three back. Yep. Imagine the owl is also on the ceiling. After that is my turn. The orogs are going to advance. This orog's going to go here. It's going to use its action to help the Remraz get advantage against the fighter. As a bonus action, the orcs can move up to their speed towards a hostile creature it can see. It's going to move to there, use its bonus action now that it can see the cleric, and it's going to attack. 21 to hit you, cleric. Right on point. Go ahead and take minimum damage of four. This guy's going to run up to here. It's going to use its bonus action now that it can see you, and it's going to attack. Multi-attack, here's the first one. 25 to hit you. That will hit. 15 damage, slashing. Second attack, 12 to hit. That will not hit. This Remraz is going to burrow into the ground. It's going to burrow to there, and it's going to dash to do so. Over here, the Remraz is going to attack. 21 to hit you, fighter. That hits. Take 41 points of piercing damage. Wow. Take five points of fire damage. You are grappled meaning you have a speed of zero, and you also are restrained, meaning that you have advantage to be hit and you have disadvantage to hit other people. After that, we're going to go to the longfish. Action dodge, bonus action, cast a level two spiritual weapon between the orc and the ramara. That'll hit the orc, the multi-attack one. 17 to hit. Miss, they have plate armor of 18. All right, that's it. After that, we're going to go to the Asia wolf. Let's cast shatter, sculpting around our lovely cleric there. Upcasting it to fourth level. 24. It's a con DC 18. Smaller orc will pass, taking 12. The larger orc will fail, taking 24. Giving the command for the simulacrum to follow up with the same. After that, we go to the simulacrum. Con DC 18, please. 29. Smaller orc is going to fail, and that's lethal. The larger orc is going to fail, and that is also lethal. We're going to move to the south as far as we can go. After that, we're going to go to the rogue blind oracle. If we can still see the large remores from where we are in the outcropping, we are going to bonus action hide, and then pop out and shoot. 20 to hit. 20 hits. 36 points of damage. Hang out there. I don't see any reason to move. Train, you are currently grappled, meaning your movement is zero, and you are restrained, meaning you have disadvantage on attack rolls. You can, if you wish, take an action to try to escape with either your athletics or acrobatics, and the DC is 17, or you can do things that you normally would do. You have the help action also. If you want to attack, you have advantage on the first attack roll against the target. Take my chances on rolling athletics to free myself. Sounds good. 19 total. 19 will do it. You spent your action to break free. What do you do next? Can I prepare an action for the next round? Probably not. I'm going to move back to the other side of that, that icicle. Okay. You're going to take the opportunity attacks as you walk away? Oh, right. Crap. No. Hang out? Yeah, hang out. After the train, we go to the owl. Same thing. Fly in, give advantage, but fly back a little bit more farther this time. After the owl, we go to the monsters. I don't see that we have to do anything different here. So the orog is going to do the same thing. It's going to give advantage to the remraz, and then it's going to move there. The remraz is going to try to bite the fighter. 17 to hit. That's a miss. Okay. The Remraz is going to... Yeah, it's going to stay there. That's fine. The young Remraz is going to pop up out of the ground, move to where the cleric is, 
and attack the cleric. 17 to hit your cleric. And that will miss. And then it's going to spend 10 feet of movement to go back into the ground. Does the Remoraz popping back underground proc an attack of opportunity? No, because it hadn't left the five foot, and also you can't see it when it does. After that, we're going to the longfish. Diagonal northwest one space. Oh, that's ice. Never mind, just put me one space closer then. Action, sacred flame on the orc. DC... He gets a nat 20, so I think he's going to pass. Never mind. Bonus action, move the hammer diagonal southeast of me. After that, we go to the top of the order, Asia Wolf. I am burning three slots to fire at the big boy, staring at a three on the magic missile. Three plus one is four, four plus five is nine, nine times five is 45. The simulacrum. He's going to burn a level three. His magic missile does a four on the die. Four on the die, plus one is five, plus five is ten, five times ten is fifty, and the older Remraz dies. Anything else? It's gonna be it for me. Blind Oracle. Let's remove the target we can see. Hide bonus action. Pop out action to attack the Orog. 24 to hit. 24 hits. For 41 points of damage. After the Blind Oracle, we go to the train. I'm gonna take my attacks on that guy. First one is 28 total. Hits. 14 slashing. It dies. I'm gonna move as close as I can. That was the train. After that is the owl. Dodge. All right, after the owl is the young Remraz. Young Remraz is gonna pop up out of the ground, attack the fighter. Nat one, go back into the ground. After that is the longfish. Prep a sacred flame to hit young Remraz when it pops out again. Cool, and you're not concentrating on anything else. After that, we go to the top of the order, Asia Wolf. Prepping a magic missile level two to hit that thing when it pops up. Cool, simulacrum. Same thing, prep a magic missile level two. So you concentrate on level two magic missile and the rogue drops three feet to the ground. More than that, 25 feet to the ground. Apologies, yes. The rogue drops 25 feet to the ground and takes three points of falling damage. The wizard falls to the ground and takes 10 points of falling damage. Give me a concentration save for your new concentration effect. Oh, that's a big old 16. And you land prone, so rogue, you're currently prone. Simulacrum takes eight points of damage as it falls. 22. Maintains the effect. Blind Oracle. Prepare to shoot the Remoraz as it pops up. Bonus action hide first. After the Blind Oracle's the train. I'm going to prepare an action to attack the Remoraz. Sounds good. Owl. Dodging. Remoraz comes up, up out of the ground. Asia will fire off your shot. Staring at a three. Three plus one is four. Four plus five is nine. Nine times five is 45 points of damage. And then the simulacrum. Three on the die for him too. That's another 45 points of damage. Rogue. Prone. Disadvantage to attacks. Does it f impact ranged attacks? Nope. Disadvantage on attack rolls. This is now a nothing burger of an attack. It has a nothing burger of hit points, so it's going to be fine. 26 to hit. Hits. 10 damage. It has three hit points, so it's dead. Perfect time for that circumstance to occur. Port hit points. Here's your wolf. 102. Simulacrum. 35. Blind Oracle. 139. Train. 97. Longfish. 118. Any end of encounter actions? Recover arrows, because these matter now. Let me just double check. I don't know that you can recover magic arrows. Don't know why you couldn't. I think they specifically say that you can't. Once it hits a target, the ammunition is no longer magical. So you could recover it for regular. Does not matter. If you missed with any of them, you could track those. Has everyone like lost at least 14 hit points? Yep. No. Only the fighters. I'm gonna do second wind. 1d10 plus 13. 18 healing. Hit points, abilities, spells, items in hand. Wizard. I am at 102 hit points, four first level slots, two second level slots, two third level slots, one fourth level slot, two fifth level slot, one sixth level slot, four charges on the Wand of Magic Missile. Simulacrum. Four first level slots. Two second level slots, two third level slots, one fourth level slot, two fifth level slots, one sixth level slot. He is at 35. Rogue, 136 out of 139 hit points, holding a plus one short bow using plus one arrows. Instrument of the Bards on my back. Fighter. 115 out of 166 hit points. Still has his great axe and the javelin. Cleric. Currently at 118 out of 137 hit points, holding Staff of the Python and Shield plus two. I have four level one, one level two, three level three, two level four, two level five, and one level seven spell slots remaining, and both of my channel divinity. Monsters, abilities, items, and numbers. This encounter has two abominable yetis. Abominable yetis have a 40 foot move and a 40 foot climb. They're immune to cold 
cold. They have dark vision, a passive perception of 15 with a maximum of 25. They fear fire. So if you hit them with fire damage, they have disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks until the end of their next turn. They have keen smell, so they have advantage on perception checks. And they have camouflage, so if they're in snowy terrain, they can make dexterity checks with advantage. Multi-attack, so that they can use their chilling gaze and make two claw attacks. They can target one creature they can see within 30 feet. They have to make a con save or take cold damage and then be paralyzed, unless they're immune to cold. They also have a cold breath, which recharges on a 6. It's a 30-foot cone for a constitution save or 10d8 cold damage, which is going to be fun. The terrain for this is mostly difficult terrain. There's some difficult terrain in yellow, and then the orange is climbable with no checks. Most of you will climb at a half speed. Yetis will climb at climb speed. Any questions about terrain? To the north, it's looking down, or is it level with the other side there? Yeah, so that's a drop. It's 10 feet down there, and it's 10 feet down there, and it's another 10 feet down there, so 20 feet over here. Tactics. Anybody have any ideas? for tactics in this fight. Hit it with fire. Yep. How do they feel about lightning? They like it the same way they like any other type of damage, which means they don't like it. Hit it with fire, hit it with axes, hit it with lightning. He's the fighter. This is probably a round for the fighter to action surge type thing to do a burden over round. Yeah, I don't think we can block, actually just check them at the choke point because they can just climb over that cliff. Should you guys fly again? Probably not on this one because this one's one or probably want to concentrate on something else versus that burrow attack coming up and eating somebody. Oh, I had a thought. I mean, we probably should head to the end of that choke point before dispersing. I guess we just focus fire the closest one, see if we can just take it down before the other one gets there. I could try to burn two fires, like two fire bolts at the start here. All right, let's go ahead and roll initiative then. Anybody have higher than a 20? The rogue has a 21. I have a 20. Anybody have between a 20 and a 15? 17, wizard. Anyone have between a 15 and a 10? 14 on the fighter. 12 on the bird. What do you got for me, cleric? Three minus one. Rogue, you're up first. I would like to move one north and then northwest spot on the diagonal from the simulacrum. Bonus action hide, 25. And then we'll pop out and take a shot at the Yeti to the north. Does a 21 hit. 21 connects with the Yeti. Not bad. 42 points of damage. After the rogue, we go to the Yetis. So this Yeti is going to move. Everybody is within his 30-foot blast. So he's going to cold breath on you. It's a 30-foot cone of frigid air. Each creature, which is everyone, makes a DC 18 constitution save. 35 points of cold damage on a failure. 17 points of cold damage on a success. 19. 18 on the nose. A 9 for the rogue. A 17 for the fighter. And the boots half that. 18 for the simulacrum. I'm not even going to bother with the owl because he's about to die. So the owl is toast. Can I get the uh, rogue's uh, final damage so I can put that on me? Haft and haft or no? It's just resistance once. You can only have one type, so you're going to take 35, so you're going to have that. You're going to take 17, and the cleric is also going to take 17. Second yeti is going to move as a dash action. After the Yeti is the Azure Wolf. Big guy on the left been hit, right? That's correct. He's my first target. I'm rolling a Firebolt, 17 on the die. Hits. 10 points of damage, plus 5, so 15. The order is for the Simulacrum to follow up with a Firebolt on the one to the right. Oh, that's a crit. 35 plus 5, 40. That moves to the west with the Simulacrum. To confirm, the second one went to the guy on the right. Correct. I was basically splitting it to give both of them disadvantage. After that, we're going to go to the train wrecks. It's a little too far. We're going to move about about halfway between to the east. Can't reach either of them from here, but I can throw that javelin, I think. A 19 to hit. Hits. A two on the die. Seven points of damage. Plus 46 lightning. And 14. Seven and 14 is 21. And that javelin's at the Yeti now. After that, we're gonna go to the longfish. Move me diagonal northeast one. Chuck a scroll of flame strike at the Yeti down the hill. Tell me about it. Creates a 10 foot radius, 40 foot high cylinder centered on one point within range. It's got 60 feet. Each creature in the cylinder must take a dexterity saving throw. Fails. Takes 46 fire and 46 radiant. Can we burn them? That's the question. 15 fire damage, 21 radiant damage. After that, we're going to go to the top of the order, Blind Oracle. Bonus action hide, 25, roll to attack, 30 to hit. Hits. For 36 points of damage. After that, we go to the Yeti. I think the train successfully stopped it, so it would have to move around you. It's only going to be able to get trained. Good move. Goes there and blasts a cone of cold, hitting its partner, but its partner's immune to cold, so it doesn't matter. Train, go ahead and make a DC 18 constitution save. 20. 
31, which you're going to avoid with a constitution save, so that's going to send it down to 15. You have Boots of the Windy Lens, which gives you resistance to cold, so that'll send that down to a 7. This Yeti is going to try to do the same thing. It's going to fail to recharge. It's been hit with fire damage, so it's got a disadvantage on its attacks. Yeti is going to climb to there. It's going to use its chilling gaze on the simulacrum. Simulacrum, give me a DC 18 constitution save. For all the marbles. 18? Chilling gaze fails. It has two claw attacks. It's going to take those against the simulacrum. First one is a 27 to hit. With disadvantage, right? So with disadvantage, I'm sorry. I rolled two dice and picked the higher. Got a 13 to hit you. The shield, I mean. A shield. Second attack is a aberrant 20. Oh yeah, so shield isn't going to do anything to do that. 18 points of slashing damage and 6 points of cold damage, 24 total. Is Simulacrum still up? No, he's gone. Azure Wolf, you're up. Well, that pissed me <laughs> off. Hi, <laughs> Mr. Yeti. I hear you don't like fire. Not so much, no. Fire bolt is the option here. Okay, a disadvantage because of the proximity. Yep. So I drop an 8 nat 20 for a 20. 20 hits. 10 on that eye. And they have disadvantage on attacks and ability checks. Anything else? That's it. Train racks. All right. I'm going to attack the Yeti next to me. 16. 16 hits. Cool. That's 18 slashing. 27 to hit. Hits. 14 slashing. And last one, 17 plus 12. Hits. 11. Lethal. I move back towards the other area if I could be able to hit him from the cliffside. After the train is the longfish. Sacred flame. Did X 18? I rolled a 19. All right, nothing. After the longfish is the blind oracle. Uh, there's no good way to do this. Hide, move back, because I can't take an oppie while I can't see you. Let's do that. Hide and move to the corner. Does a 19 hit the Yeti? Yep. For 39 points of damage. Lethal. Report hit points. 118 out of 139. 91 out of 166. 84 out of 137. 94 out of 112. Any pre-rest actions? Did we rest between the last encounter and this one? You did not. This is going to be the first short rest you've taken. Okay, then no. Hit dice. 3, 4, 18. Spending 3 and getting 30. Spending 4 for 35 total healed. Spending 3 to recover 21. After defeating the Yetis, the adventurers are going to continue their way up the mountain. Hit points, abilities, spells, items in hand. 139 out of 139 hit points, plus 1 short bow in hand. Plus one arrows in the quiver. Instrument of the bards on my back. 112 out of 112 on the hit points. Four charges remaining on the wand of magic missiles. Four first level slots. Two second level slot. Two third level slots. One fourth level slot. Two fifth level slots. One sixth level slot. 121 hit points left on the fighter, plus two great axe. 119 hit points, holding the staff of Python and shield plus two. I have four level one, one level two, three level three, two level four, two level five, and one level seven spell slots. Monsters, abilities, items, and numbers. This encounter has two frost giants and five saber-tooth tigers. Saber-tooth tigers can pounce, so if they move 20 feet in a straight line towards a creature and then hit the creature with a claw attack, they can try to knock it prone. It's a DC 14 strength save versus prone. If it's prone, then the tiger can make a bite attack as a bonus action. Frost giants are pretty straightforward. They have patchwork armor, which is not very good. They have immunity to cold. They have a passive perception of 13. They can throw rocks at you, or they can hit you with two great axes. Terrain. The terrain for this map has large chasms that you can fall down. The chasms are 120 foot drop. It is a DC 17 athletics check to climb back up the icy sides. When you get to the bottom, you might be there for a while. A couple of pieces of trees for difficult terrain, things to hide behind, some impassable terrain in the back where the cliffs are. Tactics. What do you guys think for tactics in this fight? Don't group up. Rocks fall, party dies. Mm -hmm. Either stay out of that 20 foot range of those beasts or get right up in their face. Uh, you're definitely going to want to get up there. Yep. Uh, it's going to come down to initiative, I think, whether we can get an AoE off or not. Pretty serious forward then. Let's go ahead and roll initiative. Oh, eh, it's okay. Anybody up higher than a 20? Rogue has a 22. Who's got between a 20 and a 15? 17, wizard. Who's got between a 15 and a 10? 14, fighter. Who's got between a 10 and a 5? 7 on the giants. 2 on the clerk. Rogue, you're going to kick us off. We now have an interesting question that we should have solved before we asked this. For the purposes of use magic device, my spellcasting ability and spell save DC are... This isn't stated anywhere in UMD either. Yeah, it depends on the thing. What are you trying to cast? Entangle. It's one of the bard abilities. Yeah, so it'd be charisma based? Exactly. DC 16. Okay. It's a 90 foot range. I'm going to move up to the edge of the tree. Yeah, so we'll drop an entangle on the top left. 20 foot square. DC 
16 strength save. Front cat is going to fail. The giant is going to fail. Wow. I just rolled three fours in a row. Back cat is also going to fail. Okay. A creature in the area when you cast the spell must succeed on a strength saving throw or be restrained by entangling plants until the end of the spell. Creature restrained by the plants can use its strength check against my spell save DC. On a success, it frees itself and it uses its action to do that. And it is difficult terrain. Correct. Bonus action hide. After the blind oracle, we go to the Azure Wolf. Well, I don't want to be outdone by the rogue here. Uh, you have fireball. We're good. <laughs> A hypnotic pattern, which is a 30-foot cube, and we're going to try to get that other half of the mob. And you are going to need to make a wisdom DC 18, please, or a blinding, glittering, flashy light's going to confuse you. It's going to end cap you. It's not trip fours, so that's helpful. It's trip ones, right? First saber tooth tiger <laughs> fails. The giant passes with a 19, and the other cat also fails. So I would like to move south, please. I think it's difficult for terrain, right? After the Azure Wolf is the train wraps. I'm going to move east as close as I can get, which is about 30 feet. That should still keep me out of that 20-foot leap range, correct? Very much so. Cool. If I prepare an action now, do I have to use it at the beginning of the next turn, or can I just keep moving and then use it? When you're ready an action, you use your action, then it allows you to spend your reaction to do that thing. However, you have to have a condition that your character could observe as the triggering event. So for example, if an enemy comes within five feet of me, I'm going to attack them with my axe. So you have a condition if an enemy comes within five feet, the result which is I'm going to attack them with my axe. There's a couple of other special rules for spells, but that's not going to matter here. Cool. Other than I would definitely like to prepare an action in case one of those beasts manages to get within five feet of me. And that action is to attack, I assume. Yes, with my great axe. After the train, we're going to go to the monster's turn. Creature restrained by the plants can use a strength check versus DC 16. Uses the action to break free. Sabretooth Cat is going to use its action to help the giant on its strength check, which is an ability check it can help out with. The giant is going to make this with advantage. The giant's going to get a 16 on the die, plus the giant's strength is 24, so it's going to be free. Now it has a movement speed of 40, but this is difficult terrain, so it's going to go only four squares, but the other cat is going to try to break free on its own. He's going to fail to do so. He's still restrained. This cat is incapacitated. Do I get to save against this at the end of the turn? Nope. This giant is not incapacitated, so it's going to move. He's just going to dash. So there, go ahead and hit me. And that one on the dice. <laughs> well, use up your reaction. This cat is going to leap. He's going to jump to here. Then he's going to jump there. And then he's going to make his way over there. After that, we're going to go to Longfish. You're up. Move me diagonally two squares away from the wolf. I'm going to use my action to throw my staff on the ground and create that giant constrictor snake. The snake gets its own initiative. Roll it up. 15. On your turn, you can mentally command the snake if it's within 60 feet of you and you are not incapacitated. Decide what action the snake takes and where it moves during its next turn, or you can issue a general command such as to attack your enemies or guard a location. My command is the snake will attack the wolf. Sounds good. Bonus action, chuck a level 3 spiritual weapon next to the fighter. Spiritual weapon does not upgrade at level 3. Level 2 then. 27 to hit for 11 points of damage. After the the longfish, we go to the top of the order, which is the blind oracle. Pop out, shoot the giant in front of the fighter. 28 to hit. 28 hits. 46 points of damage. Bonus action hide. After that, we're going to go to the Azure Wolf. Pop out and shoot a magic missile using three charges on the wand at that giant in front of the fighter. That's a four on the dice. Four on the die plus one is five, plus five is ten. Ten times five is fifty. It'll take fifty points of damage. And hop back in the bush. After that, we're <laughs> going to go to the train wrecks. Going to attack the big guy in front of me. Nat 20. That'll definitely hit. 27 points of damage. Second attack, 26 to hit. Hits. Reroll that because that's a one on the damage die. 13. That's lethal. Oh, sweet. Cool. Third attack. You want to advance and attack this guy? Sure. Uh, my third attack, I rolled a 22 to hit. Hits. 16 damage. That is end my turn. After that, we're going to go to my turn. The giant is going to try to shove you off the edge. Oh no. So it's going to move here to angle itself properly. Go ahead and give me acrobatics or athletics, whichever you prefer. I think you're better with athletics. 20 total. He's got plus 9 to this. He gets a 20 also. If we're tied, then the status quo remains. That is not successful for the giant. It's going to do it again. Go ahead and roll a second one. 
Also 20. He's going to get a 12 on his second attempt, so he's going to fail. The tiger is going to try to break free as an action. He's going to get a 15 on the die. That fails. Plus four is a 19. So that succeeds. Yeah. That's his whole action. But he has his whole movement left, so he's going to move through his comrade here. The other one is going to try to break free. He's going to get an 18 on the die, plus four is 22. He'll run to there. Two incapacitated tigers don't do anything. That's my turn. After that, we go to the snake. Snake is going to try to constrict the wolf. 18 to hit. 18 hits. 10 points of bludgeoning damage. The target is grappled. Until this grapple ends, the creature is restrained and the snake can't restrain another target. After the snake, we go to the longfish. I am going to action, draw the hammer, and run up there to beat the wolf. 22 to hit. Hits. For... Four damage. Bonus action, move the spiritual weapon towards the giant. And then I'll hit the wolf next to it. 17 to hit. 17 hits. Eight damage. Top of the order, blind oracle. Don't mess with a good plan. Pop out. Can I see the giant? Yep. Is he getting cover from the tiger? No, the giant does not get cover from the tiger. He's too big. Shoot the giant. Big boy. 29 to hit. 29 hits. For 39 points of damage. Step back behind my tree and hide again. After that, we're going to go to the Asia Wolf. Pull out a scroll of fireball and drop it on that guy. Sculpting around the fighter. Tell me about it. DC 18 dex. 30 total. First saber tooth tiger fails. Second saber tooth tiger fails. Giant fails. Anything else? No, I think we're in a good position. After the Asia Wolf, we go to the train racks. Going to attack with the Great Axe again. 28. 28 hits. Uh, that was a one on the dice, so re-rolling. 17 damage. Again, 28 on the dice. Hits. 19 damage. Last attack. Oof. 14 to hit. 14's a miss. You good there? Yeah, that's the end of turn. After the train, we go to Tigers. Tiger in front is going to give the help action to the giant, for the giant to do whatever the giant wants to do. The giant's going to do what the giant wants to do, which is push the fighter off the cliff. Fighter, give me a acrobatics or athletics roll to resist it. 24. Well, I got an 11, uh, but a good <laughs> thing is I have advantage, so I'm going to roll another die and also get an 11. Giant's going to try it again. Go ahead and give me another athletics. Uh, 15. It's going to get a 21. No. So you're going to get pushed. Take 42 points of falling damage as you fall 120 feet. Still conscious? Yeah. After that, we're going to go to the next tiger, which is this guy here. He's just going to dash and wind up over there. Wolf tried to bite the snake. Wolf is going to get a 9 to hit the snake. That will not hit. After that, we're going to go to the snake. Bite, since it's already restrained. 15 to hit. 15 hits. 14 damage. After that, we're going to go to the longfish. Action hitting the wolf with a sacred flame. Dex, 18. Wolf fails. 21 damage. Bonus action, keep hitting the wolf with the uh, spiritual weapon. 25 to hit. Hits. 7 damage. After the longfish, blind oracle. That's much closer to me than I want that particular critter to be. Yeah. Let's go ahead and pop out and shoot the tiger next to me. You got it. 24 to hit. 24 hits. For 35 points of damage. Lethal. Bonus action hide. <laughs> if it ain't broke. No, that's the turn. Asia Wolf. Since he's still standing there, let's do the same thing. Fireball with a scroll. DC 18 dex. 28. Wolf fails with the nat 1. That's lethal for the wolf. Giant gets a 15 to fail. Lethal for the giant. Nice. That's it for me. Train's at the bottom of the gorge. What do you do? I'm gonna try to climb back up. I said that's an athletics check. DC 17 athletics check, yeah. Oh yeah, 29. So you're going to make it 15 feet of the first move, 15 feet of the second move. You're 30 feet up to, out of the 120 that you need. After that is the tigers. Two of them are in cap. One of them is going to try to bite a snake. 11 to hit a snake. Oh, no. After that, we go to snake. Snake is going to bite. 8 plus 6, 14 to hit. Hits. 7 plus 4, 11 damage. Dead. Long fish up. Move myself five spaces closer to the northern wolf. I'm going to command the snake to move towards me. Bonus action, move the spiritual weapon 20 feet towards the northern wolf. What's your action action? Dodge. After the longfish, we go to the blind oracle. Would a rope help the fighter climb in any way, shape, or form? Yes. A rope is a DC 10 climb check if it is unknotted, but it's a full 50 feet. And if it's a knotted rope, it's only 40 feet because the knots take up distance. There's no check to climb a knotted rope. A knotted rope cannot be pulled up because the knots will run up against things. Unknotted rope can be pulled up by the person at the top. Bonus action, dash to get to the southwest of the fighter. Action, rope. Use item, toss a rope down to the fighter. Fighter is 90 feet down. Fighter will have to climb for another 40 feet to get to the bottom of the rope. God, you know what? Let's just solve this. Instead of using rope, let's 
use the bard's instrument to grant fly on the fighter. What's the range of that? Ooh, is it touch? Touch a willing creature. Nope, can't do that. I can do nothing for the fighter. That sucks. I appreciate the effort. Tie the rope off, and that's my turn. After the blind oracle is the Asia Wolf. Focus fire the north one there with fire bolt, and we're going to break it. 17. Hit. 15 fire. Then it is no longer incapacitated. After the Asia Wolf is a train. And I keep trying to climb. How many feet to the rope? 40 more feet before you get to the rope. All right. Oh, 14. 14, you make no progress. After that, we go to the tigers. This tiger is going to charge the rogue. Dash to there. After that, we're going to go to the other tigers incapacitated. Snake. Snake is going to go grapple the tiger. Rolling to hit. 24 to hit. 24 hits. 9 damage, but it's restrained. Take longfish. Hit the wolf with my warhammer. 22 to hit. Hits. 5 damage. Move the spiritual weapon towards the wolf. 22 to hit. Hits. 11 damage. After that, we're going to go to the blind oracle. Disengage bonus action. I would like to go to the northwest and then shoot the tiger. Ooh, hey, halfling luck kicks in. Doesn't help me a second time, though. Ouch. Nat one did to a nat one. Yeah. After that, we're going to go to the Asia Wolf. Pop out, shoot, fireball, 22 on the die. Hits. Eight. After that, we go to the train. Roll it up. 23. So you've made it 60 feet up now. 10 feet to the end of the rope. That was the train. Now it's the tiger's. Tiger is restrained. It's going to fight the snake. 10 to hit the snake. Miss. Other one's incapacitated. Snake. 12 to hit. Yep. For 8 damage. 8 damage lethal. Longfish. Move me 5 spaces towards the other incapped. Throw a sacred flame at it. Dex 18. Passes. Never mind. Bonus action, move the hammer next to me. Blind Oracle. Am I in range to just shoot it from here? Yep. Cool. Step back into the tree to hide and then shoot. 29 to hit. Hits. For 42 points of damage. Asia Wolf. Firebolt. 14. Hits. 17. 17 is lethal. Report hit points. 139 out of 139. 112. 79. 119. Anybody have any end of encounter actions they wish to take? Second wind. Rolled up. That's a one on that die. One plus 13 is 14. Anybody else have any end of encounter actions? Retrieve the one arrow that did not connect. Got it. Retrieve the fighter. Yep. Another encounter down and another layer of the mountain conquered. The adventurers are going to make their way even further up to find the dragon at the top. Hit points, abilities, spells, items in hand. Plus one short bow in hand using plus one arrows with a instrument of the bards on my back. 139 out of 139 hit points. 112 hit points. Wand of the War Mage. One slot on the Wand of Magic Missiles left. Four first, two second, one third, one fourth, two fifth, one sixth. Fighter has 93 hit points left, just the Great Axe left as a weapon. 119 hit points, holding Warhammer and Shield plus two. I have four level one, three level three, two level four, two level five, and one level seven spell slots remaining, and both charges of Channel Divinity. Monsters, abilities, items, and numbers. This encounter is on the side of the mountain as the adventurers make their way up a cliff face to a castle that is built on the side of it. While they do, they get attacked by a variety of flying creatures that are there. This includes a rope, also known as a rock, however you want to pronounce that, and six griffin. Griffin have a fly speed of 80, so they're going to be nice and quick. They have multi-attack with their beak and their claws, and they have a passive perception of 15, so not a challenge for the rogue. The Roke has a fly speed of 120, so even faster, multi-attack with beak and talons, and they have a passive perception of 14, so less of a challenge. They have advantage on perception checks that rely on sight, so that'll bump them up to a passive of 19, but still not a problem for the Roke. Terrain. There's a bunch of stable terrain that you can stand on, and then there's a 300-foot drop followed by a DC 17 climb check to get back up. Probably don't want to get dropped off of that. You're going to be gone for a long time. This section here is much shorter. It's only 10 feet down. Tactics. What do you guys think for tactics in this fight? AOE. Don't die. Cast fly on those of us who face check things. Range everybody else. Blind Oracle, was that don't die or don't dive? Both is applicable here. On the subject of flight, do we want me to fly the fighter? Go for it. Any other thoughts? Cleric, do you need to be flown? I mean, they can still pick me up and try to drop me off. I think that's going to happen, though. Any of us. I agree that you guys probably need to get in their face. I can cast Spirit Guardian and just wait for them to come here. Let's go ahead and roll it up, then. Anybody have higher than a 20? Anybody have between a 20 and a 15? Uh Uh-oh. Anybody have between a 15 and a 10? Well, anybody have between a 10 and a 5? 9 for the rogue. 9 on the clerk. 
fighter has eight. And three for the rope. Wizard, you're kicking us off. Yeah, I think it's a chain lightning on the big guy and let it bounce. Tell me about it. Dex DC 18. The rope fails. Give me the damage. 47 plus 5. 52. They all fail, so they're going to take 52 points. Move into that west alcove over there. After the Azure Wolf is a blind oracle. Let's go one diagonal to the south east. Cast fly on the fighter via the instrument of the bards. God, there's nothing to hide behind. That's okay. Let's go back behind the alcove over there. Bonus action hide. After the blind oracle is the longfish. Rummy towards the wizard. Level three spirit guardian. Nominated people I can see. Oops. I can stay out of your range. All right. Yeah, I'll exclude the rogue. After that, we're going to go to the train. I'm going to fly to the closest guy and whackity whack. 19 plus numbers. 19's crit. You crit on 19's and 20's. Hell yeah. Okay. So that's 17. 23. Hits. Two on the dice. You reroll ones and twos. Cool. Again, it's two. So that's nine total. Last attack. 22. 22 hits. Damage is 17. After that, we're going to go to my turn. Griffins are going to attack you. The one immediately next to you is going to make two attacks with the beak and the claw. First one's a 10 to hit you. It does not hit. Second one is a 23 to hit you. Yep, that hits. Take 11 points of slashing damage. This griffin is going to move away, provoking an attack of opportunity. 19. 19 hits. 13 damage. Next one's going to move in and attack. 24 to hit you with the beak. Yep. Take 12 points of piercing damage. Nat 20 to hit you with the claws. Oh, okay. 17 points of slashing damage. It's going to move away. Your reaction has been spent, so there's no opportunity attack there. Next one flies in. Nat 1 to hit you. It's going to miss. 12 to hit you. 12 does not hit. And it's going to fly out. We're just going to load up on this side. They're going to dash to there, and we're going to dash to there. This one's going to dash to there. For here, we're going to go drop the cleric off the cliff. So that'll be 65 feet of its move, leaving with 55 when it gets there. And then it's going to lose three additional squares of movement, leaving it with eight after this. Wisdom 18. <laughs> 10 fails. For a measly 16 damage. It's going to make a beak attack against you. 16 to hit. No, I miss. And then it's going to make a talon attack against you. 29 to hit. That will hit. That's a heck of a hit. 23 points of slashing damage. Ouch. That's a DC 11 concentration save. 17. That'll pass. You're grappled, but DC 19. You're restrained, and it's going to move with, it's because it's within the Spirit dragon. Guardian range. And because it's dragging <laughs> you, it's going to drag the Spirit Guardians with it, which is going to make it very slow to move. But it's going to try anyway. It's going to go there, dragging you along with it. After the rogue is the top of the order, Asia Wolf. That changed a couple of things that I had planned. They are packed nice and tight in fireball configuration. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. It's either that or do I try to put haste on the cleric. I think I'm just going to do the fireball thing. So you can see this point here. I think that's going to get you the most of them. Or you can move somewhere else. You'll get one more if you move. Yep, move out of my hole. Do you have to be able to see the person that you're sculpting around? Sculpt spell. You can see. So you're going to hit the fighter. And then moving out two more won't let me see. You could come over to here. Do it. I'd rather go for the big numbers. Fifth level. DC 18. 44. 44 or 22. The northernmost guy passes and he takes 22 and drops anyway. Eastern of the three is going to take 22 and drop. Western of the three is going to take 44 and drop. The rogue is going to fail with 11 and going to take 44. Anything else? That's all I've got. After the Asia Wolf, we go to the Blind Oracle. Move out from behind my hiding spot and shoot the rock. A 30 to hit. Hits. Good damage this go around. so disgusting. For 47 points of damage. Good numbers, dice. And then bonus action hide. After the Blind Oracle is the Longfish. What do you got? DC 19 to escape, right? Acrobatics or athletics are your option. I'm going to try it. 19. 19, you're free. That's your action. What else you got? Move me right south of the wizard and turn there after the long fish is the train rex train rex is going to move west one and attack that bird nat 20 crits 19 total second attack is 25 hits 19 and last attack is 26 yep 14 damage after that we go to my turn Rogue is going to start its turn off in the zone. Wisdom 18. Pass it with a 20. 15 halves to 7 damage. Rogue is going to move to there. It's going to do its Talon attack against Cleric. 23 to hit you, Cleric. That will not hit. I miss you with a 23. 
Oh, 23, no, that will hit. I thought, I thought it was 23. <laughs> yeah, I have, a, I have a plus two modifier to hit on a challenge level 11. 21 points of slashing damage, and give me a DC 10 concentration save. 20. After that, we're going to go to a beak attack on the wizard. That'll be a 24. Four to hit you, wizard. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, that's going to hit. 28 points of piercing damage. You concentrating or anything? Nope. It's going to fly out to here, and then we're going to drop the cleric. Cleric gets 300 feet down, so give me one second. Reaction? Featherfall, 60 feet. She was up to five feet falling creatures within range. The descent slows to 60 feet per round. That's your reaction. Over here, we've got three attacks to go after the fighter. Nat 20 on the beak to hit you, fighter. Uh. Take 14 points of piercing damage. 21 on the claw. Take seven points of slashing damage. He's going to hang out there. No reason to move. This one's going to move into here. 25 to hit you with the beak. Yep. Take eight points of piercing damage and 17 to hit you with the claw. No. This one's going to move in. 21 to hit you with another beak attack. Yep. Take 10 points of piercing damage. You still up? Barely. And then the nat 20 to finish you off. Yep. 11 points of slashing damage. Totally out. The last one can move, so it's going to go bother wizard. After my griffins is the Asia wolf. You can still see the fighter, but you're a sculptable bull. Fireball? Yep. Scroll, third level, DC 18 dex, 28. Fail, this griffin is dead. Fail, this griffin is dead. And fail. Anything else? Yeah, let's move back in that cove. After that, we're going to go to the blind oracle. Pop out, shoot the large bird. Something, something, not broke, don't fix it. 25 to hit? 25 hits. For 42 points of damage. Back? Yep. After that, we go to the longfish. All right, longfish, you're going to drop 60 feet. You're now 120 feet down. For my last act, I am going to level one guiding bolt. 120 foot range before you lose it. <laughs> 19 to hit. 19 connects. 17 damage. And whoever attacks it next will get the bonus advantage and turn. After that, we go to the train wrecks. Give me a death saving throw. 15. 15 is a success. After that, we go to my turn. This griffin is going to fly into here and give advantage on the roke for it to make its attacks. The roke is going to fly there, and it's going to make its two attacks against the wizard. We're going to get advantage on this attack. 19 to hit you, wizard. Yield. Pop a shield, and the talon misses. Then the beak attack. 17. My dice failed me at the last possible moment. No more reaction for you, so we're going to fly back out here. After the rogue, we're going to go to the Azure Wolf. Magic Missile, level 2. On that, dude's decided to come stand next to you. Looking at a 4. 4 on the die, plus 1 is 5, plus 5 is 10, times 4 is 40. This guy takes 40 damage and drops. What else? Move farther back in. After that, we go to the Blind Oracle. Things are broken, you need to fix them. Move out, shoot the Roke. 17 to hit. 17 hits. For 41 points of damage. Lethal. You have one person making death saving throws, what do you do? Move to the fighter. I think I have to dash to get there. That's my turn. Longfish. Drop by 60 feet. Can I maneuver myself and try to grab onto the cliff, or is it just going to keep falling? Unless you have something that allows you to move through the air without touching the ground. Train. Give me a death saving throw. Nat 20. Nat 20 will do it. That stands you up with one hit point, and that will end the encounter. Hit points remaining. 139 out of 139. 75 out of 137. One. 84. <laughs> Any pre-rest actions? Channel divinity for 65 hit points. Whoever can use it. You're going to dump them all into the fighter? Yeah. Pearl of power to get my level 3 spell slot back. Do you have a second channel divinity? Yeah, I guess we use that since the fighter is at like, what, 150 hit points? Should be able to get her all the way back to half. So then the fighter picks up another 17 hit points. Hit dice. I spent 8 and recovered 83. 6 to recover 28. Spend 8 to recover 59. Arcane recovery? Tell me about it. I could do 7, so we're going to burn 3 to get a 3rd level slot back. And let's get a 4th. I'm also summoning the bird back. Recast Warding Bond with a level 3 slot on the wizard. And do you want to summon your python now so that you'll have it ready for the next one? Yes. After a short detour to the bottom of the mountain, the adventurers are going to make their way back up and onwards to the white dragon that they know and love and will kill at the top. Hit points, abilities, spells, items in hand, wizard. 112 hit points, wand of the war mage, plus two in my hand, along with my wand of magic missile. Two first level, one second level, two third, two fourth, one fifth. Rogue, plus one short bow in hand. We are using regular arrows for this encounter. We have the instrument of the bards on our back. Fighter. 
Fighter has plus two great axe. Full hit points at 166. Cleric. Cleric is currently at 137 hit points. I have three first level, two third level, two fourth level, two fifth level, and one seventh level spell slot remaining. I'm currently holding Warhammer and my shield plus two. This encounter has four mammoths being ridden by four half ogres. I know I said it was the end of it, but this is the return of the Sarsen Zero Cavalry Formation. The half ogres are legitimate targets. The mammoths are legitimate targets. If you kill one, the other one will survive. Half ogres have battle axes and javelins. They have a passive perception of nine, so I don't think the rogue can fail to hide from them. Mammoths have trampling charge. If they move 20 feet straight towards the target and hit with a gore attack on the same turn, the target it must make a DC 18 strength save versus prone. If the target is prone, the mammoth can make a stomp attack as a bonus action. Uh, the stomp has a 10 foot reach, the gore has a 10 foot reach terrain. There's a couple of pieces of difficult terrain, some bushes to move through. The orange is climbable sections, so you can climb up that. Plenty of handholds, no check required. Tactics, what do you guys think for tactics in this fight? Take out the big beasts and worry about the mounts later. Depending on if the wizard still has like spell slots for fly, I think we're just <laughs> going to the air. Just put the party in the air. That could work. If I use a fifth, I can get three people up in the air. Can the rogue still get the fighter to fly? No. Oh. I get that trick once per day. Yeah, I don't think I picked up a fly scroll either. Well, if that's the case, at least put you and the rogue up in the air? Me and the rogue? I could do me and the rogue. Do we need to do flying for this? I could juke them out and get them all grouped up and you guys could do AoEs on them. Well, if it's the Saracen Zero cavalry thing. Yeah, we're going to be button hooked probably, or either they're just going to trample. He's going to run in, knock you over, trample you, and then run away. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Yeah. Prepare to be swarmed. All right, it sounds like we got an encounter then. Let's go ahead and roll initiative. Anybody up higher than a 20? 24 for the rogue. 22 on the wizard. Who's got between a 15 and a 20? 17 minus 1 on the clerk and 17 on the snake. 15 on the fighter. Ow. 14. I have an 8. Rogue, you're up first. I think the option is to go behind the bush that you just had your cursor under. Bonus action, hide, and then shoot the closest mammoth. Does a 21 hit a mammoth? 21 hits a mammoth, yeah. I know, surprising, but... Here we are. 36 points of damage. All set. That's my turn. Yeah. After that, we're going to go to the wizard. Move right behind that road. Let's do the fly thing for me and him. And then I'm going to raise the remainder to go up. 30 feet left. You're going to go 30 feet up? Yep. Longfish. Move me south of the rogue. Put me prone. Before I go prone, I'm going to shoot a level one guiding bolt at the mammoth that rogue shot at. 23 to hit for 12 damage. And now I go prone. Snake. I'll tell the snake to move to the south of me and get ready to attack anybody who gets within his reach. Train, what do you do? I'm going to move forward around the corner from one of the mammoths. Yeah, right there. The owl? Let's move him over here with me and the rogue and where he's just going to call dodge and fly up. After the owl is the riders. We're going to do what we expected to do, which is trample the fighter. I have to move 20 feet straight towards a creature, so we're going to go there. The mammoth is going to make a gore attack. 17 to hit you. Does not hit. Then we're going to go with the half ogre battle axe attack. 18 to hit you. Does not hit. The rest of them are going to advance. Dash. The ogre on the top is going to throw a javelin at the fighter. 21 to hit you, fighter. Does hit. Take 12 points of piercing damage. This guy's going to move through there. Most recent arrival is going to throw a javelin at the fighter. 19 to hit you. Does not hit. This one's going to move to there. That one will ready a javelin in case there is an enemy within 30 feet of it. That's all my guys. Top of the order. Blind Oracle. So I fly now. Let's go ahead and go up 60 feet. And then go ahead and take a shot down at the mammoth. Does a 20 hit? 20 hits a mammoth. Did you try to crit fish? Was the advantage? Sure. No crit. For 31 points of damage. Bonus action. Hide in midair. Dash to go even higher? <laughs> so it's 120 feet in the air. Yeah. After the blind oracle, we go to the Azure Wolf. Oh, to have a lightning bolt. That next best thing, fireball. Let's fly up 30 more feet and then fireball at level 4. Dex 18. 35. The ogre rider is going to fail. That is lethal. And that guy drops, leaving just a mammoth behind. The mammoth is going to fail. The mammoth will take 35. Number 2. The ogre is going to fail and drop. The mammoth is going to take 35. The middle ogre rider is going to fail and die. And this guy's going to take 
think. I'll assume. Anything else? Move the rest of the 30 up. After the wizard, we're going to go to the longfish. I'm going to stand back up. Sacred Flame, the first mammoth. Dex 18. Fails. For 12 damage. 12 is exactly its hit points. It drops. Nice. And then I'll back up two squares. The snake will follow me and just back up, ready to hit whatever gets into its reach. After that, we're going to go to the train. Train is going to move forward and attack that mammoth. 15. 15 hits. 16. Next attack is 22. Hits. 18. Last attack. 19. Hits. Damage is 12 points. And uh, that's it. Cool. After that, we're going to go to the owl. Seven flying. You can go 10 to there. And aggravate for the fighter. And whatever he's got left in high. After the owl is the riders. So we're going to provoke an opportunity attack from the fighter as we back up. You have advantage on this. 22 to hit. 17 points. And then we're going to charge forward again. Gore attack at 20 to hit you. A meets. Take 25 points of piercing damage. DC 18 strength save. Oh, 16. Fails. That'll knock you prone. When you get knocked prone, as a bonus action, the mammoth can do a stomp attack. So it has advantage because you're prone now. It's going to get a 13 to hit you. 13 does not hit. So then the next one's going to go... Can't get to you. Okay. Excellent positioning. This guy's going to go around to here. I'm going to try to bite you. 14 to hit. 14 hits. 11 damage. This guy's going to go around to here. The rider on top of the mammoth is going to attack the prone fighter. I'm going to get a 23 to hit your fighter. Hits. Take 13 points of slashing damage because I can use two hands on this. And that's all of my guys. After that, we go to the top of the order, which is the blind oracle. So we're going to drop down 60 feet. And we're going to shoot the mammoth. 18 to hit the mammoth. 18 hits. For 39 points of damage to the mammoth. Bonus action to pick up the extra 60 feet, so dash back up. Whee! I have to go up and down. After that, we go to the Asia Wolf. The where they're clumped up. Use the last scroll of fireball. DC 18 dex, please. That's 31 with the modifier. We're going to fail all three of them. That is lethal for the rider. This one takes... 31. This one takes 31 and drops. Cool. Anything else? No, I'm good. After that, we're going to go to the longfish. Sacred flame against the mammoth that's closest to me. Fails. Nice. For 13 damage, order the snake to restrain it. That's it. Do the snake. Attempt to restrain. 16 to hit. 16 hits. 12 damage, and it is restrained. After that, we're going to go to train. Action or a move action to get up? It's half of your movement to stand up. Okay, then I'm going to stand up and hit the mammoth next to me. 14. 14 hits. That is 10 damage. All right, next hit is 27. Hits. 19 damage. And last one is 16 plus numbers. 16 plus numbers hits. 17 damage. That loo. After that, we're going to go to the turn. Oh, it's my turn. This mammoth cannot survive leaving this area, so it's just going to attack with the gore. 21 to hit you. Hits. Take 21 points of piercing damage. And then over here, we're going to try to gore the snake. 19 to hit the snake. That will hit. Snake takes 28 points of piercing damage. All right, and then that's both my mammoths. Top of the order, blind oracle. Let's go ahead and shoot the mammoth in the back. So again, move down 60. Take the shot. Well, there's the crit. Now at least will you admit you're at 40k levels of dice. (laughs) No, because my Havocs still shoot for more dice. You have to beat my Havocs before this matters. How many dice is rolling? It's a lot. D6 for the bow, 7d6 for the sneak, and then doubled for the crit. 70 points of damage. 7-0. I think that's the new record. That mammoth drops. 60 feet back up. Yep. After that, we go to the Asia Wolf. Our bolt. Not natural 20. Okay. 17 with the mod. After that, we go to the Longfish. All right, Sacred Flame. Dex 18 save. I got a three. 15 damage. And action, the snake is just going to keep constraining it. It's got advantage. 24 to hit. Hits. 14 damage. After the snake is the train. Train's going to move to that mammoth. Advantage because it's restrained. That's 24. Hits. 10 damage. Mammoth died. Two. We did it. Report hit points. 139 out of 139. 112 out of 112. 137 out of 137. 95 out of 166. Any end of encounter actions? Either take a potion or use second wind. You can do both. Yeah. You're going to turn your snake off and turn it back on again? Yeah. If the fighter is still short for hit points, I can give her 
or two potions of greater healing. I have a total of six. I recover 16 points with second wind and 14 with the potion. Anybody else do anything? Keep concentrating on fly because it's 10 minutes. The adventurers are making the final pass up to the white dragon's lair. I think it's a good thing they got fly because they're going to need it in this next fight. Hit points, abilities, spells, items in hand, train. The fighter has 125 hit points and they're plus two axe. Blind Oracle. 139 out of 139 hit points, holding the plus one short bow, back to using plus one arrows, and having the instrument of the bards on my back. And you are currently flying because fly is left over from the previous encounter. Azure Wolf. 112 out of 112 hit points, concentrating on flying. Wand of the War Mages in my hand. Two first level slots, one second level slot, two third level slots, and one fifth level slot are all that remains in my arsenal. Longfish. Currently at 137 hit points, holding a Warhammer and Shield plus two. I have two first level, two third level, two fourth level, two fifth level, and one seventh level spell slot remaining. This is burn time. And uh, both charges on my channel divinity. This encounter is a dragon. The adult white dragon that you see before you has a relatively high natural armor of 18. It can burrow for 30, it can fly for 80, it can swim for 40. They have a passive perception of 21 and blind sight of 60 feet, so the rogue's going to be somewhat challenged in this. They have multi-attack, so they can use their frightful presence and then make three attacks, one with a bite and two with its claws. As you might imagine, they have bites and they have claws. The bite does cold damage in addition to regular damage. They have a tail attack that they can use. Frightful presence impacts things within 120 feet, and it's a DC 14 wisdom save versus the frightened condition. They have cold breath, as dragons are known to do. They can breathe on you and do elemental damage. This creature has legendary actions. It can take three legendary actions, choosing from one of its options. Legendary actions can be used at the end of opponent's turns. Those are detect, it can do tail attacks, and it can do a wing attack, but a wing attack costs it two of its actions. This encounter has lair actions. At initiative 20, the dragon takes a lair action to cause one of the following effects. Freezing fog fills the area, jagged ice shards fall from the ceiling, or the dragon creates an opaque wall of ice on solid surface. It has immunity to cold terrain. There's a couple of trees and difficult terrain for people to hide behind if they want to. There's a couple of things to hide behind inside as well. Otherwise, there's a cave lair in here. The jagged ice can only fall inside because that doesn't make any sense for it to fall outside. Tactics for this fight. What do you guys think? Burn them. Yep. Face check. We've got some spell slots. We use up what we can. This is going to be a burn fight, I think. Definitely keep away from that breath so spread out. Don't clump up. Yeah. Cleric, what do you have to concentrate with? A spirit guardian, I think, is the only one. Yeah, I didn't know if giving you a scroll of haste and having you use it would be worth it. Cleric can't cast scroll of haste. That's right, never mind. It's not a cleric spell. I'm thinking sorcerer. If there's no other thoughts about it, let's go ahead and roll initiative. Anybody up higher than a 20? The lair action goes on a 20. Anybody have between a 20 and a 15? 17 for the cleric. 17 for the wizard. 17 for the rogue. Who's got between a 15 and a 10? 14 for the fighter. 12 on the owl. The dragon has a 10. Snake has a 3. First thing that happens is a lair action. 20 foot radius freezing fog appears within 120 feet. Each creature in the fog when it appears, which is everybody, make a DC 10 constitution save. Oh no. You're good at these. I rolled a nat 1. Oh. Indomitable? Wait, you are that good at these. What's your total? 11. That'll pass. All right. It's... 10 damage or 5 on a success. Tell me about it, Blind Oracle. A 6 for a fail, so that's 10 damage. It's cold damage, though? Correct. So I have boots, which will give me resistance to cold, so I'll take 5. Train. With the resistance, round down, so it's 2 damage. Asia Wolf. 16 on the first save, 15 for the con. Part of that's going to the cleric, right? Cleric, you got a warding bond on him? Yeah. You each take 2. Snake. Snake pass was an 18. It's going to take 5. The owl. He's going to freeze. Longfish. Cleric got an 11. That's the lair action. After the lair, we go to the cleric. Run me towards the northwest? It's actually still in the cold because of the way that radii work. How about one further up? You're going to dash? Yeah. Can you dash me under the other tree? Bonus action, nothing. Order the snake to move north. After that, we're going to go to the wizard. Fly up. I'm assuming that could see through this cold thing. You are assuming incorrectly. You cannot see through the cold. It is heavily obscured. Good thing I'm flying out of it. I'm 60 up and he is inside the cave, right? Yes. Not con on anything else, so that's going to be a dodge. After that, we're going to go to the blind oracle. We're going to fly out of the fog, 40 feet to the west, directly towards the dragon. 
action, use the bardic instrument to cast Fairy Fire on the dragon. Ooh, sexy. It's a DC 13. He's going to fail. Any creature in the area when the spell is cast is also outlined. For the duration of one minute, any attack roll against an affected creature or object has advantage if the attacker can see it, and the affected creature or object can't benefit from being invisible. Now I should have 20 feet from my original move left, so we're going to go 20 feet up, and then we're going to take the dash action, go another 60 feet up, so a total of 80 feet up. I was really hoping I could get you to burn Legendary Resistance on a cheap fairy fire. It wasn't a tactical maneuver. I literally forgot about it. <laughs> but now that I'm thinking about it, like, nah, I just did it. After the Blind Oracle is the train. Move west, which was the direction I last saw the dragon. Prepare an attack in case it comes anywhere near me. After the train is the snake. Snake's going to move north. And there should be a bit of height behind the big tree. Just outside the cone. That's still technically within because of the way radii work. It's going to take eight points of damage. If I dash, I should be able to get... Because of the size of the snake, pretty much everything here is difficult terrain for it. Never mind. After that, we're going to go to the dragon. Dragon is going to try to breathe. Dragon has a 60-foot cone, which is going to clip Cleric and the fighter. So it's going to go there and then breathe. Both of you give me DC 19 constitution saves. 61 or 30 if you passed. 21. 17. Train, you're going to bump a 61 down to a 30, and then you have cold resistance, so you're going to bump a 30 down to a... 15. After the dragon, we're going to go to... The dragon creates an opaque wall of ice on a solid surface. It can see within 120 feet. The wall can be up to 30 feet long, 30 feet high, and one foot thick. This is going to disappear, and instead we're going to get a wall that we're going to erect in front of the cleric. That's the lair action. After the lair action is the longfish. So I have to walk around it. Direct east... I have line of sight. Still in Guiding Bolt range, so I'm going to chuck another level 1 Guiding Bolt at it. You have advantage on this attack roll. Hey, Crit! 8d6 for 36 damage. That's me. After the Longfish, we go to the Azure Wolf. Move to where I can get him in my sights. So I think I have to fly down a little bit. Yeah. The Magic Missile's coming his way. Upcast, third level. I'm looking at a 1. Boo. 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 plus 5 is 7, 5 times 7 is 35 points of damage. And fly back up. After the Azure Wolf is the Blind Oracle. Move down 60, shoot the dragon. Advantage for the Fairy Fire. Yep. This is a 29 hit. 29 hits. 34 points of damage. So that's a move action, a standard. Take the dash action to go the 60 feet back up. I feel like the shy guy from Mario Brothers. Train wreck. I don't think I can make that. Just going to move. Could dash action surge to get in contact if you wanted to. Actually, you know what? Yeah, let's go. Let's dash. And remember, you have advantage on all of this. First one was 18 on the dice, plus 12. Hits. 12 damage. Second attack is 18. 18 hits. For 17 damage. And third attack, 25. Yep. Two on the dice, re rolling. 11 damage. At the end of your turn, it's going to use its legendary action to do a wing attack against you. Dragon beats its wings. Each creature within 10 feet of the dragon must make a DC 19 dexterity save. Go ahead and do that for me, Train. 15. Failure. Go ahead and take 11 points of bludgeoning damage and you are knocked prone. I currently have 69 points of damage on me in total. And then the dragon can move up to half its flying speed. Snake. Snake is going to dash me south, southwest. At the end of the snake's turn, the dragon is going to take another legendary action to do a tail attack against train wrecks. Advantage because you're prone. Doesn't help that much though. 18 to hit you. 18 does not hit. Now it's the dragon's actual turn. Dragon is going to move 80 feet, flying away from the prone fighter. Fighter, you can take an opportunity attack if you wish. I do. Disadvantage because you're prone. Cancelled out because of fairy fire. 18 to hit total. 18 is what you need. 12 damage. Fairy fire dragon is going to fly 80 feet towards the rogue and it's going to do its frightful presence. Every creature within 120 feet of the dragon and aware of it must make a DC 12 wisdom save. That's everybody here. Hero's Feast. <laughs> that was close. Hero's Feast. You guys are immune to the frightened condition. The snake is not immune to it. Snake did not eat, okay? Snake needs to <laughs> So give me a DC 14 wisdom save. Rolled a 19. Let me see if I have a... If you have a negative 6 to wisdom, you don't have a negative 6 to wisdom? Okay. Then it is immune to dragon fear for the next 24 hours. Hours. The dragon is going to try to recharge its breath. It fails to do so. The dragon is now going to chow down on some halfling. Okay. Or at least it's going to try. Bite attack. 17 to hit you. On the nose. 
Sorry, halfling. 17 points of piercing damage and 7 points of cold damage for a total of 24 points of damage on that attack. We're going to use our reaction to half this. So you're going to half it down to 12? Yes. And then we'll half the cold damage again because of resistance. So the 7 goes to a 3 and the 3 goes to a 1. So you can take 10 instead. Exactly what I was going for. Oh, you a con save. 10 on the button. That's what you needed. Then a claw attack. 26 to hit. That'll hit. Take 10 slashing and a concentration save. Looking for a 10. Getting a 13. That'll do it. 18 to hit. Hits. Minimum damage of 8 slashing. Constitution check. Halfling luck kicks in. Oh. Save with a 13. That's my actions. After the dragon, we're going to go to the lair action. The lair action is going to be to pop fog in this circle here. <laughs> we're going to do it 80 feet up in the air. It is heavily obscured. Go ahead and give me a DC 10 constitution save. Pass with an 18. Great. You're going to take 12 cut to... 6 cut to 3. And a concentration save. Hunting that fairy fire. I am. I should have resisted it in the beginning. Told you. Con save 23. After that, uh, we're going to go to the longfish. Burn them. Let's chuck a level 5 guiding bolt at the dragon. Disadvantage because you can't see it. Advantage because it has fairy fire. 13 plus 10, 23. 23 hits. 30 damage. And advantage to the next person. With bonus action, I am actually going to revert the snake back. That's it for me. Legendary action at the end of Longfish's turn. It's going to use its legendary action to do a wing attack. Give me a DC 19 dexterity save, Mr. Rogue. Sure. Ooh, a 12. That'll fail. So go ahead and take 17 points of bludgeoning damage. You are knocked prone, which means nothing in this case. And I can fly up to half my flying speed, but I like my little bubble, so I'm going to stay in it. 17 for the con save. Cool. After the longfish is the Asia wolf. He is obscured. Even if I fly up, I wouldn't be able to see him. But he also can't see you. You can still see him. He's outlined in bright light. Like, he, he exists as a concept for you. You can detect him, but you cannot see him. Those are different. My spell requires C. That's the big part here. But let's fly up some more. What else is there to do right now? And then dodge. After the Azure Wolf, we're going to do a legendary action to tail attack the rogue. You can't see me, so I have advantage. I can't see you, so I have a disadvantage. They cancel out. That's a 23 to hit you. No, you can see me because you have blind sight. Yeah. No, it doesn't do me any better, though. It's just a straight up 23 to hit you. That hits. A 17 points of bludgeoning damage. Concentration save. Which I fail. You are no longer fairy fired. You worked for that one. I did. I'm also going to eat a rogue while I'm here. Taking so much damage. Like, I have outtanked the fighter in this encounter by a long shot. Yep. After that, we're going to go to the blind oracle. I have to stand up for half my movement. Rules is written. Disengage as a bonus action. Fly with my remaining 30 feet out of the circle towards the cleric. And dragons suck for rogues. Mm-hmm dash action to go behind the fighter. After that, we're going to go to train wrecks. The last I saw the dragon is in the air, correct? Yeah, you know where it is. You can detect its position. You just can't see it. But I could not reach it if it's in the air. Wait, what's the distance on javelins? Short range is 30, 120 for disadvantage. You got disadvantage anyway, so it's not going to do anything different. So I'm going to throw a javelin. Guiding bolt cancels the disadvantage. It can't see you, so that cancels the disadvantage also. So that's 14 to hit. 14's a miss. Clatters off the scales. All right. After the train is the dragon. Dragon is going to recharge its breath, or at least attempt to do so. It's going to fail to do so, so I can kill a rogue, I think. You should be able to kill me this turn. I just got to get to you. Oh, no. Flying over the top of the fighter so that we don't provoke an opportunity attack. First one is going to be a bite attack. 15 to hit you. Miss. Second one's a claw attack. 14 to hit you. Miss. And then the last one is a 16 to hit you. I got a three, a four, and a five. That will miss. No, you can't kill a rogue this turn. That's a dragon. After the dragon is the lair action. The lair action we're going to do here is to create a wall. Yeah. <laughs> wall me in. Yeah, we'll just take one of you at a time. After that, we're going to go to the longfish. Move me as close towards the fighter as possible. So the wall completely blocks line of sight. It's an opaque wall of ice. Yes. Yeah, no good action. After that, we're going to go to the legendary action of the dragon. Dragon's going to tail attack the rogue hopefully we do better than last time there it is 25 to hit that hits 13 points of bludgeoning damage we'll use our reaction to half that yep azure wolf drop down 30 and fly 30 towards the cave dodge after the azure wolf is the legendary action and we're going to do another tail attack 25 to hit you yeah that hits take 11 points of bludgeoning and then it is the blind oracle's turn so is the wall completely blocking the entrance at this point? Yes, it is. It is completely blocking it. We are going to disengage. 
Can I move through the gap in the south side of the wall? Through his square. And I'm flying, so... Oh, you got forever. Yeah. Hill count is difficult terrain, but nothing else should. Oh, that's right. Action. Use a scroll of haste on myself. Last action from haste. Dash back another 60. You actually have 120 feet of movement at that point, so you want all the way to the edge. Sure. That's silly. That's how that works out. Then I would get a legendary action. Can't fight you guys, though. You could fight your own wall. I could fight my own wall. Train wrecked. Is the dragon in the air? The dragon is not. The dragon landed on the ground. You're prone, I believe, right? You know what? Yep, I am. Stand up from prone? Yep, and that's half my move. Yep. I'm going to move to the edge of that wall. A lot of difficult terrain there. It's as far as you can get with a regular move. You can dash if you want. No. Just splitting up a little bit to spread out dodge. And then it goes to the dragon. Dragon is going to try to recharge breath. And something's wrong with this dragon's breath. We will ready an action to attack when the wall comes down. Then we're gonna go to the wall's turn, the lair action. The lair action will be jagged ice shards fall from the ceiling, striking up to three creatures. So that will be the cleric and the fighter. It's a plus seven to hit you. Cleric, that's an 18. No miss. Fighter, that's 22. Hits. Take five points of piercing damage. Well, that wasn't nearly as good. The dragon is gonna use its readied action to make a tail attack against the fighter, 28 to hit a fighter. Yep. Take 15 points of bludgeoning damage. And after that, we're going to go to the longfish. I'm not in his reach, right? Correct. You are not currently in his reach. All right. Move east five squares. And I am going to throw a scroll of harm at the dragon. Improvised weapon attack for throwing a scroll. Harm is a constitution saving throw at DC 18. Takes 14 D6 necrotic damage. Plus 11 for his constitution. So he's going to pass. 44, half to 22. On the end of your turn, it's going to take a legendary action. Wing attack. The dragon beats its wings. Creature within 10 feet of it must make a DC 19 dexterity save. That's you, fighter. All right. That is a 15 on the dice. So that's a failure. You're going to take 16 points of bludgeoning damage and be knocked prone. The dragon can then move up to half its flying speed. It's going to move here. After that, we're going to go to the Azure Wolf. Yay! I think this is about the best option here, doing the math. Magic Missile, level 5. 3 on the dice. 3 plus 1 is 4. 4 plus 5 is 9. 9 times 7 is 63. So it's going to take 63 points of damage and drop. Yay! Ooh. And that was the dragon encounter. We did it. Oofed. You have cleared out the dragon slayer, and you're going to collect all of the loot that the dragon has collected. You're going to get 42,000 gold, which is a 10,500 gold split. In addition, in the horde, you find a belt of hill giant strength, a short bow plus two, a spell scroll of reverse gravity, and a spell scroll of resurrection. The assumption, although this is not required, is that the belt goes to the fighter, the short bow goes to the rogue, the reverse gravity goes to the wizard, and the resurrection goes to the cleric. But if you guys have other ideas, I'm willing to hear them. The next dungeon for these adventurers is going to be a Beholder Cavern, which I think is going to be interesting. Another lair fight and probably some legendary actions. So we're going to head back underground to see what the Beholder has collected. What was the easiest encounter? That's the tradition. After getting to that last one, I don't think any of them are easy, but what do you guys think? Honestly, I felt the same way. I felt like these were all a challenge. Definitely agree. If I had to, I would say the Mammoth, but I mean, that's a strong, like... If getting two people up off the ground, that made it a lot easier, right? Because then you only have the tanks to worry about, yeah. especially with the cavalry formation. And they don't have enough javelins to really threaten the concentration abilities. Because that's what I wanted to do is let me get in there, break concentration on the wizard, send two of them plummeting back to the earth. That was a plan. But you guys killed all the range attacks pretty quick. So then I just had to deal with the ground wings. The giants and cats encounter also felt manageable. There's a lot of big damage potential there. We still, you know, had someone go over the edge, but I feel like that was at least managed correctly between control spells. How about the first one? I know it was a long time ago. Was the first one difficult? I felt like you guys had a pretty easy time with this. That almost went really badly. Yeah, I think this one had potential to go horrible. If somebody would have got gobbled up, that could have sucked. All right, so it was the mammoths being able to fly off the ground. Though I'm a little biased. That's always a little rough when you have to roll death saves. Yeah, you had to roll death saves in this one. You dropped and had to roll death saving throws. That was the only one, though. That was the only death saving throw we've had. And the fighter is usually the character that has to do it. You joined the Falling Damage Club. Congratulations. <laughs> Two people. I hear that's pretty famous in your campaigns. Previously, the 
the wizard got thrown off the castle. And then the wizard didn't want anybody else in the club, so he saved the cleric from the same fate. Yeah, I knew it sucked. Any other thoughts about what made a fight easy in this case? Being able to fly. These were all hard. Yeah, these were all definitely had a challenge of some sort attached to them. Leak. It was a struggle. I felt a little bit in every almost every fight. What was the hardest fight, and why was it the dragon fight? <laughs> I thought the hardest was the fourth fight. The Roke and the Griffins. What made this harder than a dragon? I felt like the fighter was just out of position really early. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have to juggle between do I want to go like save the wizard or do I want to try to go save the fighter in case like she drops. Okay. I think this encounter gets the award for most damage done to players. Yeah, really. I still think the dragon fight was harder in that if that dragon had another turn, if you had rolled better, uh, that could have again started ticking south really quick. Yeah, we got lucky that his loading his breath attacks didn't go too well for him. That was rough, just looking at that going, oh, well, uh, there's another turn that I have to go fly somewhere. Because anytime I get into melee with you guys, it's like I just get beat on. So a lot of the time I want to do hit and run. I want to jump in, blast somebody, and then get to a position where I can't be seen again. The fog is lifesaver for that. Let me drop a fog there and then go kill somebody in the fog. Yeah, that was great. This was by far the hardest encounter. It was hard because of the layer actions, not the dragon. I agree. It's a force multiplier effect, right? Because the layer actions on their own are not dangerous. I mean, not really. Not not really dangerous to you guys. Nah, if you didn't have the fog, we would have shredded the dragon. Well, that's what I mean. It's the dragon is the danger, and then the layer actions make it that much more dangerous. If I just fought you with layer actions, you guys would have been fine. If the layer itself had 200 hit points. Maybe you disagree. Do you think if you had to fight a layer that had a bag of 200 hit points, it would be more dam damage to you? The turn you dropped that wall in front between the fighter and the rogue yeah and the like the turn you block me off i had two turns to just keep chucking flame strikes at you yeah it could have been another 76 it could be another yeah, 10 d6 to give perspective i think you could have put any monster in here it didn't have to be a dragon of like similar caliber and the layer actions would have made it just as difficult in some regards like that's what i'm getting at yeah it is absolutely a force multiplier the layering actions made this encounter what it is without those this is a walk in the park dragon or no i think the breath attack although i only got to do it once it dictated how you guys acted as well because you're like all right everybody scatter in different directions and then you don't have the support of the cleric being able to heal people or the wizard being able to buff people because you're all spread to the winds, which is smart. That's what you want to do. In the fourth fight, you have the potential to be out of the fight in one go. Comes in, scoops you up with a challenge, drops you off the cliff, you're out of the fight for the rest of it. That isn't really a threat in the dragon fight. What makes the dragon fight more dangerous than the potential for a one-shot KO? Well, we know the one-shot KO was out of the window because you can only do, like, what, a maximum of 90-something damage to us? Right, but you're still at the bottom of the hill. I don't mean a death, right? I'm not thinking of fatality. I'm just talking about, like, you're knocked out. The dragon doesn't have that potential. The out-of-the-fight aspect is huge, which is the other thing is you took the healer out and one guy was unconscious. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I felt like the AoE and thinning that... Maybe it's because we ended up with the rogue tanking this fight that I'm sitting here going, this is the hardest fight. And maybe it's because rogues hate dragons because it's like, oh, let's just turn you off. So I think that might just be perspective. Especially white dragons because they do con as their breath instead of dex. And you're like, eh, it's a dex save. I'm good at this. I'm taking no damage. How much damage did I do to you in this fight? So I came into that fight with 139. I ended it with 52. Oh, okay. That is the single most damage you've done to me in a fight. 80-something damage. And if you hadn't biffed all three of those rolls, oh my God. probably should have downed me. <laughs> or at least got close <laughs> enough that you could have done it on the legendary actions afterward. In the first one, the tactics that I recorded for you were go airborne and start throwing javelins. Because of the format here, you can throw fly in the first, third, and fifth encounters, and you'll get them in the second, fourth, and sixth encounters because of the way we have things set up. Is throwing three flies in every dungeon worth the benefit? Depends on the fight, honestly. Yes and no. If it's a bunch of ranged attackers, probably not. If it's a, if a bunch of creatures who don't have ranged attackers, yes, because you basically get the advantage at that point because they can't hit you. You can do damage to them from a distance, so you take the numbers off the board. If there is a terrain effect like the big hole in the ground you're going to throw somebody off of or throw them in the pit of lava or fill in the blank whatever you want to put there yeah fly is definitely a great little thing if the mob has fly yeah it's great to have somebody in the party if not all the party to have that type of a movement i think rogue got fly a couple of times fighter got fly once 
from the outsider's perspective is a good use of resources. You know, it was really helpful in this encounter. It meant that I could not be gobbled up. Because this encounter, they actually have enough reach to get to you because the ceiling was so low. It particularly helps me, though, even without being able to dance in and out of reach because I'm only 25 feet speed. I am partial to things that make me move faster as a stunty, so that's just me. Fighter? Definitely wild playing a fighter who can fly. It definitely changed the game in this fight for me. I've fought Remarazes in previous campaigns, and they're a nightmare. But being able to fly definitely helped a whole lot, and I feel like I was able to successfully distract them from cornering us in that little alcove there by splitting off first. The movement speed that you get from flying it was wild for a fighter, and that was just fun for me. To me, it was worth it. I feel like I probably would have been more worth it to have it in the flight with the birds than in this fight. Well, you had it in that fight as well, but it was coming from a rogue. For the people receiving fly, which I suppose is also the wizard in some cases, how much of a concern is, well, if the wizard loses concentration, I'm going to drop from the ceiling. So I'm going to hedge my tactics against that threat. Do you care? Or is that just like, well, that's just a thing that happens? For me, that was definitely a thing that was like, yep, that that, that could happen. I, we're taking the risk. And since my job is going in and fighting up front, it's a thing I'm going to have to face if we get there. Yeah, because we experienced that in this fight, because I I goofed up with the concentration. It dawned on me as soon as everything was taken off. I was like, son of a gun. That's the problem with readying actions as a spellcaster is that it's going to consume your concentration. So people are going to start dropping. Any other thoughts about the first fight? Just the, the shape of the map looking like a skull on accident. That was fu- That was cute. The second fight was Abominable Yetis. Your tactics were hit it with fire, which I think you did properly. Nova round. I don't know that this turned into a Nova round. Indicated that you couldn't block off the choke point, which is correct because they can just climb up the sides. A question to fly or not to fly. Make it to the end of the path before splitting up, which some of you did. Train, you absolutely fantastic positioning. I don't know if that was intentional or not, but absolutely fantastic positioning, preventing the Yeti from being able to hit more than one person with the breath attack. So congratulations on that again. And focus on the closest. Wizard, you mentioned that this could potentially be a Nova round. In hindsight, was that the right call? And did you think you guys Nova rounded properly? No, we didn't Nova round this one because the guy wrote a note, did not do that. Probably could have dropped or done enough damage to take one of those breath attacks out. Luckily, it didn't recharge and we didn't have to deal with that second one. Did we action surge this fight? I feel like this was a... We only action surged in that last one. That, and I was thinking if I should have healing warded the uh, the simulacrum, or would that would, it, would that have mattered? Simulacrum cannot be healed, cannot gain any resources back. So let's talk about that for a moment. Simulacrum has how many hit points? Half of the wizard's hit points. 40. 40 to start with. It's got all but the simulacrum level spell. Knowing that it's so fragile, knowing that it can't be healed, how do you feel about your resource expenditure in hindsight? Good and bad. I probably could have prepped this guy a little bit better with... A cloak of protection and i took mage armor off completely forgetting that i needed a scroll for him and so he didn't get that bonus either yeah he could have had a little bit more protection on him versus what he had this round i don't think he did well i've been in several campaigns where a simulacrum does amazing the raw amount of like random aoe that we were dodging or dealing with in this encounter and in the sort of just one-off damage that the simulacrum ended up taking made it hard to protect the simulacrum because the simulacrum is another squishy that needs to get protected that's extra fragile it also would have been cool if we could have burned through all of the simulacrum spells aggressively not that we have the time right that's not on anyone to make that choice we just didn't have the time with the simulacrum but I I could see it being really useful well that's kind of what I was looking at going well he only has 40 hit points he's got level 6 like why wasn't the level 6 just a straight up level 6 magic missile terminating something just immediately just snap your fingers and that thing dies knowing that this thing could get critted and just die in one hit at the drop of a hat and it's not coming back I was surprised that how conservatively you played the simulacrum spells that it wasn't just Nova, you know, balls to the wall, foot on the gas the entire time, throwing that thing as fast as possible, knowing that it can't come back. Yeah, no, and that's what I said. Like, I think I played this a little bit wrong in this one with his resources. Yeah, so the first fight, I was using the haste because I was trying to spread that around instead of upcasting my haste. Well, I could have upcast his as a level six and got everybody too, but... You mean fly? Fly, I'm sorry. Yeah, I could have upcast with him too on that one, and that was an option. But yeah, I think I did misplay him this round and for my tactics he was a huge target because i can take an entire wizard off the board with a lot fewer hit points and a lower ac and not all of these abilities and, and items and whatnot so in the third fight 
First of all, Rogue, welcome to the Concentration Club. Indeed. <laughs> we'll give you your team jacket, embroidered and engraved and everything. The tactics were don't group up, stay out of range or close, one of the two, and AoE depending on initiative. You guys mentioned don't group up. What was the logic behind not wanting to group up in this fight? The rock of the giants there, that rock throw could have potentially been harmful. But they're not AoEs, I don't think. I'm going to double check. I feel like they are. I think they are, but that's just... Nope. One target plus nine to hit, four d10 plus six bludgeoning damage. They don't get to multi-attack with it. Huh. Uh, yeah, that's news to me because I, I could have sworn they were AoEs. No, it's just a single target attack. Okay, so that was the logic behind that, but it was based on a false assumption. Okay, that makes sense then. Stay out of range or close, it's absolutely true. Because of the way it's worded, though, they can back up and then charge, so it's kind of difficult to stay out of the range of that. Or it's like to get in the sweet spot where it's too close for them to do it, but too far that they actually have to move. If you had asked me ahead of time, I would have bet money that I was going to be able to send one of those cats around to maul the wizard, but... Wizard, you are actually completely untouched in this fight, I think, by the end. Well, I was just going to chuck the Python staff at, like, that corner. Unless you assign a giant after that corner, I don't think anything's going to get through. Yeah, it created a nice choke point with that snake being there. This was, I think, the first snake. Is that right? Yeah. How do you like pet summoning? This one didn't have, like, five succubus lined up to cast a gesture on it, so it definitely works. <laughs> <laughs> And train, welcome to D20 Tactics. Here's the edge. We're going to push you off of it. <laughs> I should have remembered because I think you've told me private conversations about this, but it totally escaped my mind. I think this is going to show up a lot more. It's a valid tactic. And a lot of people want to use it now since BG3 came out. Yeah, I heard about that in, in BG3 that they're like, yeah, just shove people off the edge. The NPC will just try to eat you into a chasm like any, any chance they get. Mm-hmm. And you're the hardest person to make it happen on because you got the best athletic score. So. Any other thoughts about the third one? Stupid bard instrument for the win. Like stopping those two wolves for, what, two turns? I was looking it up, and I count as having a spellcasting stat modifier of zero because I don't have a spellcasting stat. Interesting. That is what it is, rules as written, that's in the DMG. A rogue using use magic device never has a spellcasting stat, so I just get my proficiency mod. So it would be a 13, 8 plus 5? Yeah. It's always going to be a 13, unless I steal, like, a Wand of the War Mage or something. You want one? I mean, you've got the Simulacrum. Uh, this seems like a, I can't hold that many things. Wand of the War Mage, I don't think bumps saving throws. I think you might be talking about thinking about Pact tack or pack tack pack oh yeah the the blood vial is the one I'm, or whatever it is rod of the pack keeper yeah okay okay it lets you return spell slots it's a nice one it does that but it also has a bonus and i think that you gain a bonus to spell attack rolls and to the saving throws of your warlock spells never mind there is nothing to to make that better it, it's it's fine yeah there's feats that do it but we don't use them in this so exactly the crazy thing is if i used a feat to get a spell on my list somehow, like if I took Strixhaven Initiate or... Magic Initiate. Anything else that gave me a cantrip somehow, suddenly I tie that to my charisma, I have a casting stat, and it goes up by three. It's ridiculous, but it's fine. Fourth encounter. I think this one was my favorite just because I got to throw people off the edge. It's so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> so much fun. I was thinking of going straight up Mexican flag and using the eagle to grab the snake. That would have been so funny. <laughs> That didn't happen. And then you, as a bonus action, turn it to a rod as it's flying down the... The tactics in this one were AoE, which is smart because there's a bunch of enemies. Don't die. Most of you were successful in that. <laughs> Cast fly for the face tanks and range for everybody else. Well, the rogues threw a singular fly on the fighter. Cleric didn't get one. Why did the cleric not get fly in this fight? I think if the initiative had worked out, you know, I would have went with him instead. But the choice was... I had a group of AoE potential on one side that was really nice, and same on the other. And the Rock and all his little friends, because didn't I take out most of those right at the beginning? The initiative order was, you go first, then everybody else goes. Yeah, but I think I took out three of those at the beginning with that lightning, chain lightning. You hit four of them, you didn't take out any of them. Just the AoE potential kept lining up. When I had the chance to do the fireball, I was like, okay, do I cast haste now? Because he's safe and he's going definitely going over the edge, or do I do the fireball? Train, thoughts about face tanking this fight? Should not have split off from the party so soon, I think. I think I just rushed in too fast. I think that it was probably not wrong of me to take advantage of the flying and just get in there at all. There was no way I was going going to be able to hit them at all without that flying so cheers to flying <laughs> what do you think about your positioning going to a spot where people were having trouble seeing you that was n not wise 
In retrospect, should not have done that. <laughs> Anybody else have thoughts about the fourth one? Contender for the most difficult? So to say, at the same time, I think your positioning there, if you would have been a little bit farther back where people could see you, but you did keep them separated so that it did help with the fight. It allowed us to deal with the others off the other side, and we had just the rock at that point. My question is, like, A, you did an action surge, even when you were surrounded by, like, six of them. Action surge is absolutely a thing that the fighter has. Indomitable also never came up. The second question is, like, when the rock was about to chuck me off the hill, like, instead of trying to kill the one thing that's already being shot at by the wizard three times, by the rogue three times, like, you went up to the, the fairly healthy small guys. <laughs> Fighter was in the same corner the whole time, and then eventually got surrounded. There were three rocks that, uh, and three griffins that attacked her and then backed up. Mm. She went after the griffins that were just like far deeper in the corner, rather than just it's like turn three, turn four. The the rock had grabbed me and was start trying to like drop me off the cliff. You think the rock should have been the focus target? Yeah. Interesting. I don't want to rake train over the coals for not knowing fighter abilities because they were very helpful in stepping in to fill a hole that we had so but it's still like three attacks potentially killing it gotcha focus is absolutely a, a thing that needs to happen and essentially there was a fighter fight happening in one corner and there was an everyone else fight happening on the other three where you guys essentially got to fight everybody else while the fighter delayed them if the fighter comes over to focus that prevents that from happening asia wolf in your opinion which one is preferred you split up the enemy so that the remaining party members can focus them down or that you guys should all just focus damage on the same thing and let the enemies do whatever they want without getting distracted i think the split was the better call even though yes we probably could have focused that rock down i do get that the fact that these guys could give flyby like the owl does when he's not dead that's a huge thing. They do not have flyby. They can help. The help is what you're doing, not flyby. I mean, because there was, what, six of them in this fight? Yeah, six of them giving the other three advantage is kind of strong, or giving that rock advantage is really strong. So being able to kind of keep them busy off in fighter land was kind of great, I think. It worked out. It wasn't perfect, but it worked out on this one. On to the fifth one. Tactics here were target the riders and fly from the wizard. That's Pretty much the only thing that we had there. So fly worked great. You guys flew up in the air, got out of range of anything that could cause a problem, and then just eliminated all the targets. So that was fine. Fireball to take out the riders because they have 30 hit points. Evoker's fireball is going to clean that up pretty easily. They also have minus one to their dexterity saves versus a DC 18. So they were rolling 19s and 20s to survive for half their hit points left. That didn't go well for them kind of talked about this one already is what made it the easiest fight maneuvering around this map i don't know what i was thinking when i put this map together like oh yeah we'll just have difficult terrain everywhere and like throwing 15 foot creatures <laughs> trying to like all right well we're always moving at half speed because we're mammoths not trying to step on any crates or barrels so you went back to a big map i see <laughs> a little bit was fly actually worth it <laughs> Yes. Yes. Because I think eventually what ran into was he choke point himself. It was worth it for me and the rogue. The fighter blocked the first mammoth and then they, they just stopped. Yeah, they couldn't really go anywhere. It was a whole parade. It was still worth it. It meant that there was zero damage coming into the rogue. It meant that the rogue got to pick whatever target they wanted. It was absolutely worth it from my perspective. Yeah, 100% agree with that. It got me off the ground. There was no chance of me getting gored at all. Rogue, I think I know what the answer to this is, but what is the calculus like for being able to hide versus flying up in the air where it's impossible for you to hide behind anything? The calculus is, do I need the advantage to hit at this point? The mammoth said, what, AC pants ac pants so don't roll a one functional advantage to not roll a one so as long as there's something to proc the sneak dice not taking damage and not taking resources from the party is more important than hiding and dashing around the whole point of hiding and dashing around is to make sure i don't get hit and to make sure i generate sneak. if there's an alternative way to generate sneak dice and an alternative way that is less resource intensive flight is just as good when you're flying and the wizard's flying then the enemies are going up against the fighter which means they're charging into melee with the fighter and they're staying there they're not leaving which means oh well now i have an ally against the enemy yeah how serious of a conversation are you going to have with the wizard about the wizard staying below 80 feet up so that you can hide behind the wizard that's what i was just going to say i was like we need to probably start working out that strategy <laughs> <laughs> that's ridiculous and i love it 
there's one other thing in the air for me to hide behind, and he's 90 feet up, and I'm shaking my fist at him. So I was sitting there thinking that when you said the whole hide thing, I was like, you know, we need to work that strategy out now. I, you know, in this case, it worked out. Like I said, I could I could use the fighter or the snake later on, but if they were harder to hit, or if, let's say, for whatever reason, this fight had broken out differently and I had to go hunt something down, yeah, it might have been better to, to use the wizard to hide behind. That's ridiculous. Groundlings, cleric and fighter, how do you feel about being abandoned by your squishies? I felt like I wasn't too bothered by it. <laughs> no, not too bothered by it? Why not? Because the mammoths were choke pointed and I just sort of just hung out and hit them as they came by. It wasn't too much of a problem for me. Turn two, I thought like the mammoth, the first one was just going to run past the fighter straight like at me. And then the second, third and fourth were just going to basically do the same thing but they didn't so just like oh i'm, I'm just gonna back up away from the charge the 40 foot charge thing you dropped prone in this one what was that to avoid the javelins uh yeah i thought you're gonna throw javelins the wizard nuked all the riders i wanted to throw javelins but i wanted to throw them at the wizard to crack the fly and get a bunch of falling damage any other thoughts about this one Basically, the wizard broke the bond of this encounter by just flying up 90 feet. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you got to stay within 60 feet. Oh, that is 100% true. We technically did not have it on in the last encounter, which didn't matter. I don't think I hit the wizard in the last encounter. That's true. Yeah, I would have taken four damage instead of two. Your tactics in the adult white dragon fight were burn them. Don't know that that happened. Face check them. That definitely happened. Keep away, spread out, no clumping. And I think you guys did that one fairly well. What about the rest? Face check, fighter, was that a good choice? Yep. Though it was quite annoying having to chase the dragon around. Wizard, feel like I saw a distinct lack of burninating happening. And the logic was with the math, it was better to do a magic missile than a fireball when you start to figure out what the potential damage was. No, that's absolutely true. Also, I can legendary resist a fireball. That was the other part, because you're just going automatically half. And I was like, all right, well, math-wise, magic missile comes out ahead. You're a magic missile machine at this point. Hilarious. Just wait. Next level. It's going to get higher <laughs> over channel. <laughs> oh, that's right. Oh, good God. No, I don't like it. I don't want it. Okay, well, that's fine. Cleric's going to have to start patching up self-inflicted wounds on the wizard. But if you're taking damage, you're going to have to make a concentration save. So maybe that's just going to work out for me. <laughs> As a healer, the only thing I don't do in this party is actually casting healing spells. Nobody ever drops below half. Nobody was ever close to dying that, like, mattered. Ouch. Ooh. Wow. You're going to say that to the fighter's face. <laughs> At that point, it didn't matter. I was more than 120 feet do away. okay, then. Hold, hold on. Let me go get you another shovel. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say. Even if the fighter had died, like, by the time I get back up, I'll just be like, all right, revivify. Passes a DC-19 charisma save. Pulls himself out of that hole. <laughs> layer actions. This is the first time we've had layer actions. How do people feel about layer actions? I think Blind Oracle said they're more terrifying than dragons are. <laughs> Don't let me put words into your mouth, though. The wall and, like, fog of code that just, like, makes you not able to see the thing. Just... They were what made the fight hard. Yeah, it's, they're, they're like a buzzing bee. It's an annoyance when you're trying to focus on the bigger dragon that's over there. <laughs> yeah, one of them was jagged spikes fall from the ceiling. I wanted to do it just to get it out there because so we could talk about it, but looking at it, I was like, this is not very good. No. They never are, except for like a couple of them, like the Demogorgon, his lair actions tied with his area of effect are freaking crazy. The fog, I think, was really good. It was damage and... Sight obstruction. Heavily obscured and blind sight, which is a fantastic combination to throw together. It was great. It was absolutely great. It's a good fight. It took a little bit of like moving around and positioning and tactics to go with, but I liked it. I was really surprised that we got as much value out of that fairy fire. Really? For a throwaway, I thought you were going to burn a Lego out. I should have. I should have. I don't I don't know what I was thinking. What I was thinking was I completely forgot that I had legendary resistances. And then when you asked me about it, I was just like, oh, no, it's just fairy fire. It's not the end of the world. And then I can't save against this at every turn. Wait a minute, I have to go find the rogue now. Oh, man. I felt like I won the encounter right there. Like, e even if you had to burn all of your resources to kill the rogue, I felt like I won. Like, do what you must, I have already won. It was absolutely a case where your character on its own could not solo this encounter. With three people around you, you effectively <laughs> did. <laughs> because you're just like, okay, well, I'm going to tank all the damage, and I'm going to do a bunch of damage, and I'm going to give everybody else advantage to do these abilities. So you proved what you were talking about in the last set, where you said that the rogue is basically an off-tank at this point. Yes. I was reading the Guiding Bow, and apparently it doesn't need line of sight. 
just a creature of your choice within range. Correct. Yeah. So a lot of ranged attacks. That's true. You can shoot it at a thing that you can't 100% see. Running around, keep chugging Guiding Bolt at the dragon until it like eats enough like 46s. Yeah, absolutely. Maps. How do we feel about the maps of this? First of all, the layout of the maps. Do we like them? Do we not like them? I like all of these maps. They were good. It seems more harmful and you're in with the terrain and stuff, but I like the maps. Some of them, yeah. So this was not a great choice on my part. I wanted something open for the mammoths, and then I got this, and I was like, oh yeah, that's open. And then I started trying to use it and then realized it was very much not. Falling's not fun, but they were fun otherwise. All right, so I was going to ask about that. There were two different encounters that had the possibility to fall off. Is that fitting for the level you guys are at, for the type of encounter that we're doing, for the type of dungeon we're doing? Yeah, it's a valid strategy. It's always a valid strategy. It is straight up, it is a gear check. And I think a lot of us over-prepared for this by grabbing things like, I don't know, Boots of the Hinterlands, which I won't say it was a mistake, right? Because we did reduce damage, especially in the case of the Rogue, right? There were other options for where we could attune those items. And I think that at this level, it's a reasonable gear check to say, at 13 or 14th level, do you have a solution for flight? And I think that's a reasonable request by the DM. Because this level forward, most parties have, like you said, gear. They have all these options with gear at this point where they're kind of picking and choosing what they need. And I think, yeah, I agree with you. I think we went a little over on the boots. But the boots protected us on what, second and second, third, and six? I don't think anybody here had cold. Also, this one definitely. This one, I don't think anybody here had cold. The dragon and the other fight was basically when it came up. Just the breath attack here and the breath attack here. Heck, the Remoraz did fire damage. At this level, our gear check's reasonable, saying, you know, you guys should prepare and have the gear that is necessary. You should have the spells that are necessary to show up to these fights. Is that a reasonable request from the GM of the players? Or anytime you have a binary, there's no counterplay here. Either you prepared or you didn't. Not an enjoyable thing for the players. It's a reasonable thing because at this point, the party should be well-versed. and if, Especially if they're at level 13, they should know basically what they're coming across or have some idea of what they're coming across and know how to prepare. They're experienced as an adventurer at that point. Especially if they've worked their way up to 13 and didn't start that way. Players should also have budget at this point. I, I know that 5e is supposed to be you get the magic items you get but i don't think that's accurate or correct i think that in a reasonable game where you're having lore and backstory and dialogue and players have agency to choose where they're going that they're going to prepare and that they have resources to spend on that preparation i think that depends on the game that is being run absolutely have a situation where the gm's like you're going to get the magic items that you get and there's nothing else to say about that but in that situation then gear checks aren't reasonable because <laughs> what was the player supposed to do that or everybody plays a caster like, those are your choices. You either let your marshals, your non-casters, or half-casters prepare, or everyone plays a gish and no one has a good time because you're only playing tier one. Tier one gear. Tier one character building. 3.5 concept. Tier one is the highest tier or the lowest tier? Highest tier. So theme, the theme of the encounters. Anybody feel that the encounters did not fit the theme we were going for? It's perfect. Any thoughts about that? Everybody loved their little winter wonderland? <laughs> Needed more snowman. I don't know that I would steal this one. Like, I told you when we did the demons, like, Straight up, I would steal that encounter. Like, I was going to steal that whole thing start to finish for when my players get that high up. This one, I don't think I'd steal, but it was still fun. I, I would modify this one a little bit, but I would probably still use this when, if my players needed a challenge. What would you change about I think that's party-based, but I think the bird fight is perfect, especially if you're going through an area like this where you're kind of making your way up a mountain. I think the bird fight was perfect. Because, yeah, you're going to have a spot like that where you're going to run across something like that. I might would have swapped the mammoth burst type thing as you're coming up to the mountain type thing just kind of maybe jingled the order around that i absolutely see we didn't really have a big scary monster fight we did have a big scary monster fight but it was the last one so that's usually the only thing that changes about that blind oracle same thoughts similar thoughts other thoughts knowing my party and my players i would actually change how the bird fight is structured just because i i know that their tendencies and and i've got a forever fighter in my group i have one player who only ever plays sword and board fighter he only plays sword and board fighter and I have to make accommodations for that when I build encounters to give him something that is entertaining for him. Like, I have to build an enrichment piece in for him. I also have a, a preponderance of melee. Like, even my support casters are like, you know, I'm perfectly happy to stand shoulder to shoulder with the melee. And I'm like, okay. Okay, so yeah, people should adjust. Well, that makes sense. Build encounters that are reasonable for their groups. Knowing that I'll probably keep Heroes Feast in my lineup forever, like, would you still build things that had, like, Frighten as its main ability? I think yes, because... Draw of the Dragon is not the Frightened, but I understand I should be throwing it anyway. So the 
step blocks say like do this action and then do this action and then do this action that sort of thing so for a dragon that's a thing where it says you can frighten and do everything else for other things there's effects that are like oh it, you can just do the fear effect or you can attack them so i won't be doing the fear effects against you guys i still will be including those as a dm because i think it's important that you play into character strengths so if a person's like oh i'm gonna ratchet up my armor like okay cool i'm gonna make decisions based on that right rather than just simply ignoring you like okay well i'm never gonna use any attack rolls ever again because one person has really high armor so i'm gonna punish them for building their character i don't think as a dm your players are gonna enjoy that i think that players should be able to use their mechanics that being said continuing to include monsters like that continues to encourage you to use hero's feast i just threaten you with a fear causing monster or a poisonous monster and you guys spend one of your six level slots at the beginning and i don't really have to do anything about it so if i never did a fear encounter again then you would never take hero's feast again and it kind of turns off those tactics i certainly won't be doing things that are like oh i'm gonna intentionally hit you with fear with an opportunity cost of something else that could have done something the players when you get that moment of oh no we're immune to it it always makes the players feel good too as much as i enjoy you guys playing in this game the goal is not to be entertaining for for you guys the goal is to do all of the things that we do in this channel so those sorts of maneuvers as a gm i'm not going to do but i 100 percent agree that a gm in their game at home if the goal is to tell an engaging entertaining story should be using abilities that play into character strengths so that the players can role play their characters being strong i think that's absolutely a thing that they should be doing i think it's fun to screw up at things making those mistakes and that happens on the gm side as well like the dragon steps up and roars at the top of its lungs and beats its wings and and looks down and the fighters just giving it the finger going yeah let's fight dude come on i like those sorts of situations where it's it's fun to make mistakes it's fun to screw up things that's part of the storytelling that should be going into a dungeon dragons game just not this one because that's not what we're here for yeah we're here for tactics train wrecks thank you for joining us thank you for coming in and filling in the fighter slot i hope you enjoyed it the next set of encounters is going to be beholder i don't know i've ever run a beholder in dungeon dragons before so this will be fun really i know i've done beholder zombies but i don't know i've done an actual beholder so a beholder in its lair should be cool there's also a bunch of other really interesting stuff in that fight so i'm looking forward to that that's all for the encounters climbing up the mountain of a white dragon next week we'll continue with level 14 and fighting through the tunnels of an ib slayer thank you for stopping by. I'm Saracen Zero, and I hope to see you then.